Welcome to the Food Junkies Podcast. Here, we aim to provide you with the experience, strength, and hope of professionals actively working on the front lines in the field of food addiction. The purpose of our show is to educate you, the listener, and increase overall awareness about food addiction as a disease with abstinence as the solution. Here, we talk about all things recovery. Most importantly, how to thrive rather than just survive. So stay positive, make a change for yourself, tell others about your change, and hopefully the message will spread. Happy Friday, Food Junkies listeners. We have a very special episode for you as Brenda Wollenberg is back, and she's going over the Food Junkies team results from her gene reset assessment and evaluation. If you missed part one, please go back and take a listen. In this episode, Brenda gives us a recap on the contributing factors to addiction. She talks about genes and variations. She takes us through our individual case studies, um, really focusing on food and mood, food and energy, or optimal fuel mix. Brenda takes us through protein, carbohydrate, and fats recommendations. She takes us through supplements, caffeine, raw and cooked vegetable recommendations. We really talk about how it takes support. The three of us talk about our takeaways and how to get in contact with Brenda. Take it away, Clarissa. All right. We're so excited to have Brenda back from Nourish Your DNA. She, this is part two episode. Welcome back, Brenda. Hey, thanks so much. I love being here with you guys. It's very good. Great. Well, we'll just dive right in because I'm really excited to get into like our individual case studies, but I know you gave a bit of information on this in part one, but before we start deep diving into each of our Nourish Your DNA reviews, can you explain a little more about what you see as contributing factors to food and perhaps like addiction as well? Absolutely. Because I think there are a number of factors that contribute to addiction. I'm actually going to use an acronym, ACDC. Not so much that I love the group, okay, but because I'm getting older and acronyms are helpful. So addiction, I'll come back to because I think the other three play a role in it. The first C is culture. And I think what's going on around us right now plays a huge role in food dependency. You know, we're told to eat whatever we want, no restriction, you know, intuitive eating. The food industry strengthens that dependency with things like sugar and everything and bliss points, you know, the perfect combination of sugar and fat and salt. I think then again, the genetic impacts are leptin, our ghrelin, you know, the different kind of hunger and satiety singles that we do. So culture I think is the first thing that really contributes to some addiction. Addiction. Uh, deficiency is the D word. And my clients like to think that, oh, yes, I'm deficient in something that means I need to have chocolate. And really, we, we don't have a lot of nutritional deficiencies as isolated that way. But they do impact, again, if we're not getting enough zinc or enough B vitamins, really impacts our cravings. And so they do play a role in that. Chatter is the C that I look for emotional, mental health responses to food, all of which you three are very, very familiar with. We're calming, we're numbing, we're protecting, we're providing. And when we, I think the reason I most love talking with you is that we get in to therapy, we get counseling, we're learning how to self-regulate, we learn how to calm, but it still feels like something is not clicking. We're just, it's, you know, there's still things that are coming. And I think that's where the genetic components of addiction play a role. I'm going to just end on a quote from uh, the National Institutes of Health, where they said that in family studies that include identical twins, paternal twins, adoptees, and siblings, suggest that as much as half of a person's risk of becoming addicted to nicotine, alcohol, or other drugs, I would add sugar in there, depends on his or her genetic makeup. So, it's a whole ball of wax. It's not just one or the other. So there's my little intro spiel. Okay. Yeah. And I love that you said that because we very much work from the biopsychosocial spiritual model and in believing that that is how de- addiction develops. And we know the huge impact that a pregenetic disposition towards addiction will have. And we see that in many of the individuals we work with. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And you feel like you can offer compassion and empathy because you get that bigger picture, which is brilliant. Yeah. Absolutely. So you concentrate on metabolic genes, fat and carb response genes, stress response genes, and detoxification genes. Can you start comparing some of those genes in each of our DNA reviews and then share 
the different types of recommendations that would come along with those gene variations? Absolutely. And we're going to start with the genes that have the most implication on our responses to food and mood, as understanding those has profound implications for overall wellness. So I'm going to call them the genes that impact your energy and your agency. All right. So energy is going to, for the most part, be what you're putting in your mouth, which I'll cover a second, because if you don't have a lot of agency and motivation and self-efficacy, then it's you're not going to move forward even to wanting to put certain things in your mouth. And that whole agency component, the motivation component, has to do with neurotransmitters. So that's where we're going to start, okay? I think that the big one, and I, um, Chris has sent me some, a couple of little additional questions of her own, so we're going to start with ones that lean a little bit towards her. But we're going to start with serotonin production, and that is primarily the TPH2 gene. And again, just reminding us that typically these genes have a component that's an enzyme that they're converting to something. So with this one, it's converting tryptophan to a serotonin precursor, 5-HTP, and that regulates your sleep, your appetite, your mood, really helps you to have a, a positive state uh, around relaxation and healthy eating behavior. So three, you're eating your nice foods with the tryptophan in them. You've got the meats and the eggs and the proteins. And this little SNP, this genetic variation, helps convert it to 5-HTP. Some of you do that really well, Vera and Molly. Not a problem. Okay, you eat that, you tickety-boo begin to make 5-HTP. Clarissa, on the other hand, okay, is heterozygous. And again, reminding for our listeners, that means from one of her folks, her biological folks, she got the normal aspect of this gene. And from the other parent, she got the variant or the gene vulnerability component, I would say. So that means that Vera and Molly can make serotonin reasonably well from the food supply. Carissa is going to have some trouble, and this is where you're going to want to watch how your moods are doing. You're going to potentially, and you're going to unmute in a second, tell me if any of this rang bells with you, but probably want to take some 5-HTP per the super helpful recommendations of Julia Ross, who I know you've had on recently. She's my huge, she doesn't know this, but she's my huge mentor in the whole field of amino acids. And so you will want to have that on hand probably all the time. So if a stressful week is coming up, you know you're going to just need to have a little bit more of that. So does that make sense, Clarissa, at all or not? Oh, yeah. 5-HTP, honestly, was a huge game changer for me. And at the time when I started, it, it again was based on Julia's recommendations. Yeah. And knowing that when I did her craving quiz, it was the serotonin I was low in. So that's when I started supplementing with that. And it was like this sense of calm and peace that I hadn't had in the longest time. And so for me, it's been that and GABA actually um, yeah. both ended up yeah. being very beneficial. And so I find a supplement of 5-HTP during the day and then the evening Tryptophan is actually a little bit more calming and sedating, I would say, is okay. actually my go-to in the evening. Okay. And this is the part of this that is not magic bullet. This is the part that really is, I don't think trial and error, but you you have to figure it out because you are heterozygous, so you do have some ability to convert. And, you know, on my go-to, I would say, oh, don't even bother with tryptophan because, you know, it's going to be more expensive and not as much of it converted, but clearly for you, you know, this is the right way. So I love that trial and error. For Vera and Molly, it doesn't mean that they are never going to struggle with aloneness or they're not going to have times when they might be drawn to some emotional eating, for example, but it's less likely that it is due to their genes not being able to make the 5-HTP. So for all three of you and for listeners, there are other things that we can do to increase serotonin. So your diet, you know, making sure you're getting the foods that have it. Exercise, aerobic, seems to be great. And I you can probably nod closer, but we talked before about exercise and how beneficial that's been for you. I also really, really recommend the use of sunlight for mood regulation and on that circadian rhythm. Some of you are Dr. Andrew Huberman fans, a professor of neurobiology and ophthalmology at Stanford University. And in one of his podcasts, 
he talks about sunlight exposure. So 10 minutes within an hour of getting up in the morning. Those of us that live in rainy Vancouver, you might need to do 20 or 30 minutes out there, but that can be a really good thing for helping with mood, no matter of our 5-HTB kind of ability to regulate that. Okay, one caveat with this, well, just if you are already on a, an SSRI, so you're already on a serotonin enhancing supplement, you want to do the amino acids with the cooperation of whoever you're prescribing, physician, psychiatrist, whatever is for that. You will likely need to taper off the SSRI with their support very, very slowly, and then add in this as well. So don't just randomly go off things or, or throw things in, all right? Okay, any thing on the the serotonin you guys are I was just wondering you mentioned ah. serotonin diet could you mention some foods that sure. would amplify serotonin absolutely so it's basically serotonin is an amino acid it's building block uh, I'm sorry 5-HTP uh, and tryptophan are amino acids are building blocks of protein so that means then a need for regular protein intake every single time you eat every meal every snack there needs to be at least a small amount of either a meat, you know, a nut butter, whatever doesn't is not triggering for you, but some kind of egg. Uh, those of you that can eat dairy, a little bit of dairy. And so just making sure that you're always pairing that. And believe it or not, know that this is a food junkie, no sugar, low carb, which I totally value and adhere to as well. But tryptophan does often cross the blood brain barrier with a small amount of carbohydrate. So if you eat a couple berries in the day or you have a little bit of, you know, squash or whatever, it can be good to have that as an evening snack and help cross that blood brain barrier at night to help the serotonin production. All right. Okay. The, the next kind of brain agency hormone that I want to talk about and SNP is the DRD2. And this has to do with dopamine production. And I'm going to give you a few recommendations at the end of this as well. And they will apply both for dopamine and for the serotonin. But this one has, and I know you three are all familiar with this, just such an impact on our cravings. And it's kind of interesting because even our particular cravings we have can give us clues as to which of these two neurotrans, which of these two amino acids is in a little more or I guess less supply. So a lot of sweet cravings are often for the serotonin. And, you know, the chocolates, the cookies, the ice cream, and Carissa, you might want to note if those are really rearing their head, then pay attention to the stress levels, pop next to 5 HCP. For the, you know, Clarissa, or sorry, if Molly and Vera are thinking, oh, no, I'm good. I don't have the serotonin thing. I don't have much sugar craving anymore. Realize that with dopamine, it's often more for savory things. So the chips, the, the crackers, the things that nuts, those kind of things where you realize you're just drawn to them and, and overeating those a lot. Now, with this particular SNP, we need to understand that dopamine is so important. Like, it is essential when we are struggling with addictions, no matter what they might be, the more socially acceptable ones like, you know, workaholism or, you know, running or whatever, or ones that we are, you know, typically looking at as addressing because they're more self-damaging is that it is because we're trying to make ourselves happier and calmer. You know, we do this as a natural way to feel good. And so when we're looking at these neurotransmitters, it's not about slapping our wrist or how come I'm struggling with this. Like these reward-seeking hormones play a huge role in our motivation and in our ability to get up in the morning and feel excited and feel pleasure about our day. So super important. So DRD2 is the one that we look at with dopamine, and there's several dopamine receptors in that. So with the program that I use, I can typically get data on three or four of them. So we think about your pleasurable events, a romantic evening, a satisfying sweet tooth, wild and exhilarating bungee jump. I see some of your social media posts, people, okay? <laughs> a glass of wine. Dopamine is released. Our brain associates that with the event. Bingo, we have this reward system. Now, the challenge with, with you three and many of us is that there are two aspects of dopamine production. Number one, actually making enough, okay? When we don't make enough, we can have lethargy and restlessness, feel anxious, and feel a drive to pursue some kind of activity, gambling, online shopping, high-risk sexual activity, whatever it is that is the coping mechanism that we have 
gone to to get that response. So with the U3, uh, the three or four variations I can get, Vera has three out of four of them that she is heterozygous. So one each from her mom and her dad, the other one she's normal. Clarissa has only one that she's heterozygous and the other ones are normal. But don't get too excited yet, Clarissa, because I want to throw some other things in there. And Molly, and don't get too discouraged, Molly, but all three of the three that I was able to pull data on for you, as you know, you are heterozygous for the gene vulnerability, okay? And all that that happens, all that that means is that you simply are low in production, and it has to do with the dopamine receptor, so how you lock onto that like a lock and a key. And what we want to see happen is a locking on, and then we want a reprieve. It's like a negative feedback system that says, whoa, we have enough you know, cortisol, we have enough dopamine, we've got enough epinephrine, all these stress hormones, let's, let's shut this down, let's unlock these receptors, let's have a period of calm here. So we want a nicely functioning negative feedback loop. You don't, all three of you have a few challenges in making enough. And then I also want to look, you guys will remember maybe, the COM-T gene, which detoxifies the reactive, you know, products of these stress hormones and helps to move them out so we can make a new batch next morning and we can get up and we can, you know, do something that we love doing, get out in nature, do whatever. So when you have a calm T, its role is to break that down. So to make room for some more coming in again. And this is where you really want to look at gene interplay, not just, oh, great, I've got this. No, 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 and, and we're just going to even cover minute amounts of interplay here today. But Vera, who was pretty good with the dopamine production, is challenging with her breakdown of it. So Vera, your homozygous, if you remember, for the variant, the really low Com T activity. That means vulnerability with the breakdown of dopamine. So your receptors are staying locked and loaded. That means, which you think might be good, you know, high levels of dopamine in the prefrontal cortex. And, but because you've got three out of four genes that are heterozygous for not making a lot, you're a little low in production. You're not breaking down very efficiently. So what that means for you, and you can tell me in a minute, Vera, if this resonates with you, you know, you're going to have better executive function, so strong performance in non-stressful settings. When things are routine, you just get to them, you get things done, you're motivated, you self-start pretty well. But if there's pressure, there's a lot of stress coming on that potentially you're going to feel a little more vulnerable under that, a little more prone to craving responses, a little more feeling that anxiousness. And you become, they break it down with the calm T into a worrier versus a warrior. And typically, Vera will slip into the warrior, you know, finding some reward-seeking, stress-reducing behavior might naturally arise from that. So is that, am I saying that at all, Vera? How are you? Hey, Food Junkies listeners, we're just going to take a quick break here to share with you something our team thinks could help benefit your recovery with food, body, or self. Thank you again for listening. Sweet Sobriety has two amazing workshops in the month of July. Be sure to join Molly Pinkshop, licensed clinical professional counselor and licensed addiction counselor on Fridays as she covers codependency from codependent to interdependent. This workshop may be for you if you have low self-esteem, familial dysfunction, depression, anxiety, stress, low emotional expressivity, having a hard time saying no, having poor boundaries, showing emotional reactivity, feeling compelled to take care of people, having a need for control, especially over others, having trouble communicating honestly, fixating on mistakes, feeling a need to be liked by everyone, feeling a need to be always in a relationship, denying one's own needs, thoughts, and feelings, having intimacy issues, confusing love and pity, displaying fear of abandonment. This workshop will identify what codependency is and isn't. It'll help you identify why codependency and addiction go hand in hand. It'll explain how codependency affects recovery. It'll teach you how to recognize the signs as an individual and in relationships if codependency is an issue. It'll help you identify your attachment style and how you can shift it. It'll help teach you how to prevent codependent relationships from developing, and it'll support you in working toward interdependence and independence. 
What you'll get are pre-recorded videos to watch at your own pace, downloads, worksheets, and resources, and four one-hour live sessions that will be recorded and available for replay. Join us Fridays, July 7th, 14th, 21st, 28th at 12 p.m. Pacific or 3 p.m. Eastern or 8 p.m. UK in July. The workshop is $50 US. And I also wanted to let you know that we are running a free foundations workshop for anyone who has purchased the foundations course. This is a work at your own pace course of $200 US. And we will meet on Wednesdays, July 5th, 12th, 19th, and 26th at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. UK, and we'll cover three modules each week. Be sure to check the show notes for the links. Now back to the show. If you have enjoyed this episode, please let us know. We love to hear from you. Kindly leave us a review on whatever platform you listen to our podcast on. We love getting feedback from our listeners. So if I were to translate what you said, that would be like when things are routine, I'm pretty good with being on the ball, which is true. And then when things are stressful, then I turn into warrior mode, which I guess means foraging for thrill. Or, or it's like, <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. Would, or, or I become a warrior, like very angry and very, um, like I'm not a warrior. I'm a, you know, get out of my face. Ah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's really interesting. And again, that'll be because you're kind of half and half on those. And uh-huh. how are you going to, when the stress hits the fan, how are you going to respond? And it sounds like you rise up and, you know. I, I fight. I don't run away. I fight. And okay. I don't worry. I, I fight like unnecessarily, which is, you know, one of my character defects as it were. And again, even that I would say, we talk about character defects or we talk about you know, these genes that, oh my goodness, why do I have these genes? We have them because they evolved to get you alive and well here today. So at some point in your, you know, maybe three or four generations ago, Vera, that was a super helpful trait, just less, less, less helpful now all the time. Clarissa and Molly to some degree as well, you end up more in the, what would typically be seen as the warrior. And what I mean with that is you more easily get bored, procrastinate, you know, when things are like routine. I, I wish you guys could see this. I know this is an audio podcast, but I love the nodding. Okay. <laughs> so what happens is, you know, it's like you're, you're kind of tapping your fingers on the desk toy. Okay. I need a little excitement here. And yet if stress happens, like you're, you come upon an accident or there's a major crisis or you have a huge deadline you are on the money, like just, you know, <laughs> you, you have reduced executive function with the routine everyday things, but improved performance in stressful environments. You're, you're the people we want to have around in an emergency situation. Now, I'm going to say one more thing, and then you guys can unmute and tell me what you think. What happens, though, is we can get almost addicted to being in those stressful situations. You know, we perform well, that we're in our element, we look good, we feel good with all that adrenaline and cortisol going there. So you, you know, with you the stress and all the higher need for neurotransmitters and for folate and serotonin and other things that happen, you know, you are, you know, you're, what happens is that HPA axis, when you're under stress, has trouble returning to balance. It gets, like I said, almost addicted to the stress responses, and it feels less fun and less, you know, just, ah, when that lower element comes. So the problem is that, again, that addiction, that inability to come down is not helpful either, and we can seek other behaviors or other foods that keep us at that elevated level. So, you know, does that make sense, Carissa and Molly? Let me know what you think. Yeah, yeah. for me, for sure. Like, I think I start every conversation with, oh, what's new and exciting? You know, (laughs) like that is my, the line that I say. And it makes a ton of sense considering my background, working a lot in crisis, right? In the shelter system. And like, you know, most people, when they see the police roll up, they're like, "Uh uh-oh. And I'm like, yeah, like now it's game on, which it, and it was, I was always very calm in the crisis. And then it was, yeah, it was the after effects that were not so pleasurable, but during, you know, when you have like suicidal ideation, all these other things going on where people usually are like, oh my gosh, how do I manage? That's when, for some reason, it was like, that was when I was operating at my best, I would say. Yes, super clear-headed, 
focused, know what to do. Molly, what about you? Does that resonate at all? Yeah, I would say the same. Clarissa and I only met like three years ago and we have very similar histories of working in crisis. I worked in corrections. I worked the suicide hotline. I worked sexual assault response, all of that. And that was, I would say, yes, like that was when I was like on my game and and I was my best. And it's in the lulls that I really struggle. Right. So I used to really describe myself as like a boredom eater or whatever, right? Because it's like, I needed just something to get back to baseline. Now, ever since I really left that world, so to speak, I've tried to do a better job of not being so, because like you said, like I could see myself getting addicted to that crisis cycle. What I have seen it play out then is this periodic like burst of workaholism. So, right. So it's like, I will cram it all in and I'll be like, oh, what are my deadlines? And right. And like podcast interviews and what other project can I say yes to? And I'll go hard. And then I peter out. I start to burn out. I need to like take a step back. And then I really like relish like the downtime, right? Like it's almost like oh. I I have to have it. Oh, and then, awesome. but then I hit that wall again and I'm like, okay, now I'm getting bored. So now it has to happen again. So, and it's funny. It, I mean, you can watch it. I mean, Clarissa's laughing wow. at me because I think we recognize it in each other and our schedules are kind of like off. So like when she's starting to kind of you know, tank, so to speak, it's like, I'm really getting ramped up. And I don't know if we just play off of each other at this point, but it's good that we're not on the same cycle probably, but also I don't know how good it is if we are like playing off of each other's energy, but yes, absolutely. I would say everything you said is, is hitting the mark. And, okay. and if I if I can just yes. say, it's yes. so interesting because it's such a contrast to me. When when it's crisis, I, I I'm like like I said, I get aggressive and angry, and I want it back to the routine. The routine is where I really thrive. Well, you got to look at my my uh, calendar. I love all of those things as long as I can fall. But when it's out of out of realm, I don't like it. I'm not thriving. I'm like God damn it. Why is why are things not organized? I don't like stress. <laughs> Okay, so so you and this is when you start understanding genetics, you start understanding your partner better, your clients better, your patients better, yourself better. And Molly, just in response to, you know, I don't know if this is good or not. These cycles, you actually know they're they're not because we know that stress hormones play such a significant role in everything from aging, mental wellness, whatever. We need them, but we need them in small amounts. And Molly's issue is a bit different in that I mentioned you were lower in the dopamine production. You also are homozygous for what should be the best variation of a calm T, meaning normal, normal. But in this instance, it just breaks the little dopamine you're making down so much. And that's why the drive to the workaholism, the, you know, get it. And, and so with this, I'm going to make a few suggestions for tools again, okay, because it's similar to the vulnerabilities with serotonin. These are, after all, stress response genes, okay? So a diet that includes, again, the protein, uh, dopamine is made from the breakdown of tyrosine, again, an, uh, an amino acid, and that's in things like, you know, all the protein foods I mentioned before. And then the other thing is, is that none of these things are made in isolation. They are created with like zinc, for example, and folate are two of the the nutrients that help make dopamine. So that means greens and seeds and the meat again. So we can be looking at a broad diet. I call it an optimal fuel mix for me. And we'll be talking about food in a minute. We're going to move into that now. But just really wanting to uh, make sure those are included. And then Vera, who is homozygous for that variant, you really want to avoid stimulants, things like caffeine, you know, rhodiola. They're, they're not your friend. Uh, Clarissa and Molly can, t- just with this variation, you get a little bit uh, away with a little bit. But again, Molly, those that vulnerability with the whole DRD2 receptor, that doesn't do well on caffeine. I think that's why you always want to be cross-linking this. You will read an article and you know, some magazine and go, oh, I, I have that gene. That means I can guzzle four cups of coffee a day. I'm like, no, no, no. You have four other genes that make that much coffee really a challenge. So overlaying them is a really good idea. The next thing you can do with both the serotonin and the dopamine is you really have to follow carb recommendations. And I'm going to give you those in a minute when we look at the food and energy section. Carbs and dopamine and cortisol are highly related. The whole glucose, 
cortisol, you know, the way that that cycle works on our elevated cortisol leads to elevated, elevated glucose. So we really want to make sure that we're supporting this as, as, as well as possible. Get enough protein, which I'll talk on the next one. And then again, aerobic exercise is a great method, method of stress management, looking for physical therapy work, so massage, osteopathy, reflexology, regular amounts of that for all three of you. You know, hopefully it's in your plan somewhere and you can be using that. And then we're seeing much more science linking this now, but uh, ongoing mindful relaxation whether you choose meditation or yoga or forest bathing or centered prayer, whatever it is, that has to be a regular part of your life, my life, most of our lives, to deal with the cortisol that we deal with now because of the massive stress that we're experiencing in the world in general, okay? So those are the those are our stress response, a couple of them, the dopamine, serotonin. Any answer on those before I move into the other ones? You're all good? Okay. But can you see... If you have your own set of reasons of why you come to these behavior patterns, then you better know how to work with yourself, with your patients, your clients, to then begin to bring some resolution to these, all right? It gives us a lot more compassion for people who are dealing with addiction in any form because so much of it is related to this. Okay. Next, uh, food gene. So the FTO is one of the most well-researched genes, and it, connect, it connects appetite with obesity. It's both a metabolic and a fat response gene, and lots of genes are that way. Like I'm talking about them a bit in isolation today, but they, there's so many things that they do. So this one really helps regulate your ghrelin and your leptin. And for those listeners who are not super familiar with that, Ghrelin is a hormone that helps to stimulate hunger, let you know that you need to be food-seeking. Leptin is a hormone that says, hey, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm satisfied. I think I've had enough of that. So depending upon your variations with the FTO, then you're going to have some challenges potentially with simple sugars, with saturated fat. It's likely with this that you will burn your fat slower and you're not going to feel full. These genes, and you guys vary in this, you three women, but you need a wide range in the difference of protein that you eat. So someone that is homozygous for this, for the normal, that me, needs the smallest amount of protein. Someone that is homozygous for the variant, and none of you are, Clarissa is the most, she's got a heterozygous there, you will need actually double the amount of protein of someone like me, for example, and someone like, you know, Vera and Molly. And I think this also really helps us, again, when we're looking at working with people, because people that have the FTO gene and the homozygous for the variant, the gene vulnerability on the max, they are starving, like, all the time if they're not getting enough protein. Even Clarissa, I'm imagining, if you yeah, if you don't get enough protein, it's just the sense of hunger is is almost overwhelming. Like it just drives you. And with the dopamine, because again, protein makes it breaks down into the tyrosine and then into the dopamine, this is going to be really key for you too, Clarissa, to help with that cycle there that you have with that. So any questions around protein amount? Do you want me to remind you of the amounts that you're supposed to be doing in the day? Well, it might be helpful for listeners, sure. too, just to get a broad idea. Yeah. Yeah, yeah sure. if you don't mind. Sure, I, and, absolutely. And, okay. All okay. Right. So, Vera and Molly, you roughly would look between 0. 0.6 and 0. 0.8 grams of protein per kilo of body weight. And I, I'm not a huge fan of, you know, to rate everything out all the time, but it's really helpful to do it initially so you can actually see how much that is. So, figure out how much you weigh in kilos. And then, you know, give yourself 0.6 to 0.8 grams per kilo. Just look at that and go, okay, I got to divide that between my three to two to three meals today. And because you, neither of you do many carbohydrates, I would go towards the high end of that. All right. Carissa, you're 0.8 to one gram uh, a day, at least needing that. And then my, my clients that are the, you know, the double homozygous for the variant, they are going to be eating up to 1.2 grams of protein per kilo. That is like twice as much as, say, beer will be, okay? I got to say, that just seems like not enough protein for me, a point, point. Like, I eat a lot of protein, and I, I think I would be hungry if I didn't. 
So here, I love that you said that, Vera, because that segues into the MC4R2, because okay. those, those are guidelines that you kind of start there, okay? But then I look at the next gene that plays a huge role in hunger and satiety. It increases your metabolism. You know, there are links between this with comfort eating and, you know, particularly of high caloric foods. And this one, when I look at here, I go again, okay, so of the three of you, uh, Clarissa and Molly are normal on this one, no challenges, Vera, heterozygous. So we go, yeah, you may not have needed a lot of protein with your FTO gene, but you are going to need to up your protein because you've got this gene and it is going to be an issue if you're not getting it up. So you are right, Vera, absolutely. And it's interesting too because, Vera, in some ways you show less kind of vulnerability Food addiction and dopamine connection and that, but this is these are the aha moments. Go, oh no no! If I'm not getting enough protein, I'm going to be gravitating to these other things. So really really good. One other interesting thing about this is that, particularly for Chris and Molly, with the fact that you're normal in this one, intermittent fasting is tolerated, but it's not necessarily beneficial. Have either of you tried intermittent fasting? What's your experience been with that? Yeah, I actually don't really do breakfast. I do like a coffee with MCT oil, but I also think that it is probably due to like my workouts and I've just got a lot of cortisol going on. And so I'm not hungry and it's probably stressing my adrenals. I also noticed when I wore a CGM that like that dawn effect I have, it goes from like 3.6 to like seven. So it probably would benefit me to eat breakfast. So it's something I am practicing and trying, but I, I think some of it too, like I've talked about on the podcast before, is that I enjoy that feeling of morning anorexia, we call in the uh -huh. eating disorder world. Um, yeah. However, what happens when I don't always eat breakfast is then I get hungry in the evening, which I don't like either. Because I'm right. looking for that that third meal I need. So right, right, yeah. So you just totally talked yourself into, like you said, beginning to practice a little. It doesn't have to be like a huge meal at six in the morning. It can even be like nine, ten, but maybe lengthening your feeding window. You might actually yeah. feel a bit better. How about yeah. Molly? Have you tried? Oh, yeah, I have. How's it I I have. There was a, about a year in my life where I was pretty like, I guess, open to it. And so it was happening quite a bit, but I never had any of the benefits that like anybody ever said that they were having. I'm like, I don't, I don't have this clarity that you say that you're having. I'm just thinking about how hungry I am <laughs> and how I want my next meal. Also, you know, there were groups where it was for weight loss and whatever else, because I do, I am a person who has the genetics to, I mean, I do, I, I trend towards obesity. I had gestational diabetes. So I'm like, constantly working to not develop type two, all of that. So, you know, again, intermittent fasting has been touted as a way to kind of prevent that. And I guess the thing is, is like, I can't know if it works until <laughs> I know if it works, but I just, you know, I have no interest in intermittent fasting. I rather just have my three meals a day and call it good at this point. <laughs> You you answered, and this is what I love again in exploring with people and dialoguing with them what their experiences have been. A lot of times we answer our own questions. We just didn't actually know there was a question related to that. And so segueing into the last gene in this section, the ADIPOQ, one of the variations of it, I really want to cover this because all three of you are homozygous for the variant. So you've got the most vulnerability in this, and it just overlays everything we've already talked about. So this one is specifically associated, Molly, you'll be happy or not happy to hear this, with regaining weight, okay? And the production of adiponectin, which is an insulin sensitizing and anti-inflammatory hormone. So, and it is triggered when you are eating foods that are not in your optimal fuel mix. So that again is when you know oh, I should be eating at least as much protein. You know, in a minute, we'll talk about whether I should be eating raw or, you know, cooked veggies. How many carbs should I be eating? Once you nail down the fuel mix that your body's going to function on, this is not triggered in the same way. But if, if you're not doing that, then yes, absolutely regaining weight, including more than what you did last time, unstable glucose and insulin levels contributes to, guess what, yo-yo dieting, typically a higher BMI, increased food cravings, even when you are at a healthy for you, comfortable for you size. So it's, you know, it's like, okay, all three of us, 
know, we are homozygous for this. So let's eat our optimal fuel mix. Let's be kind to ourselves with that, all right? The next set, okay, I, I wanted to add something. I, I made little notes for each of you here, okay? So I realized I forgot to tell Molly one. So Molly, I'm just gonna say for a minute here that again, that you have super helpful genes with the FTO, so the protein one, the MC4R, you know, they're kind of like green light, not worries. But just, again, looking at the impact of the other genes, they are influenced by that dopaminergic pathway. So even though, in theory, oh, these should be great, because of the gene vulnerability with the dopamine production, that's why there can be the triggers with the ghrelin, and that's why the hunger and the, the constant sense of needing to snack. And then what happens is, is we overeat. We, we eat more than we actually need, but it's being driven by uh, hormones rather than an actual really need to eat this, okay? So just, again, be kind to yourself. That tendency towards over, I would say, and it's probably over fat. Would it be not overweight, like you're carrying excess body fat around the abdominal area or not? Yes. Yeah, that's yeah, correct. Yeah. Exactly. So that's how these hormones work is let's, let's, let's store this for, you know, Molly's, I don't know, drought that's coming up this winter or something, you know, so that's where they'll pack it. Okay, fat response genes. Uh, I've already touched on one because the FTO1 is both a metabolic and a fat response, but I want to touch on one in this category, and this one is the APOA2. There are other genes to look at with consideration of things like saturated fat intake, but this is the most and here is where, Clarissa, I might have to get you to decide you're going to stop your bulletproof coffee, okay? <laughs> so here it is. So this one has to do with saturated fat. And just a quick refresher for any listeners who are like, ah, oh, I can't remember what that is. It's like the typically the fats that are hard at room temperature. So the fat that's in dairy products, the fat that's in coconut, you know, butter, the skin of chicken and that marble fat around steak, that kind of thing. That is the saturated fat, the polyunsaturated, monounsaturated, typically liquid, so olive oil, avocado oil, avocados, olives, what's found in nuts and seeds. So this gene is specifically related to saturated fat because this gene affects your HDL, your high-density lipoprotein, and therefore it impacts the ability you have to basically moderate LDL from your blood. So it's a really important factor with cholesterol levels and triglyceride levels and those kinds of things. So Vera and Molly are heterozygous. You've got one of these from each of your parents. You do need to still pay attention. Clarissa is just off the charts, okay? And with this, some of other Clarissa's genes give indications she should kind of drop to 28 grams saturated fat a day. With this gene, and this one overrides all the other fat genes, this is like, closer we got to get you down to 22 grams of saturated fat a day. And I hate to break it to you, but the tablespoon of MCT oil will probably give you 12 before you're even out of the gate in the morning, okay? so I switched to one teaspoon after meeting with you. So, and I actually, like, it has totally changed the way I eat completely, and... I like really eat the lean proteins now. I wash all my saturated fat and it has been a game changer for how I feel in my body. Okay, in what in what way? Like when you say feel, like what how does that So the I feel like bloating, I feel like uncomfortability in any kind of inflammation. What I notice cuz I've I'm, I'm an athletic person, I work out every day and what my muscles are starting to pop in my body again, which is interesting because this kind of first happened when I dropped the sugar and this kind of transition happened. But what I, you know, when you first told me this, I was like, this makes so much sense because I tried keto. I tried carnivore. I gained weight, was bloated, felt awful. I felt sick on eating that way. And so it always leaned me towards a higher protein, like low carb way of eating. And now I just had to like adjust my proteins and watch for like the oils I use. So now I have, I use more nuts. You know, I've yeah. really been very, it kind of messed with my mind a bit because I went back to low fat eating, which is like oh, what I transitioned yeah. from in the first way was like, and what I, you know, really work with a lot of clients about, okay, don't be scared of like fat. Right. Yeah. And so that was why I was really interested in you talking to people like how they could really understand that, hey, this might be a thing for me. And then 
okay, like, what do I need? How do I eat if I eat this way? And that it was, I thought I was lactose intolerant, but I was eating high fat dairy. And so I switched to (laughs) 0% and I'm not lactose intolerant at all. It was the saturated fat and the cheese and dairy. So this changed the game for me completely, Brenda. So thank you for that. Oh, you're so welcome. And and I get what you're saying, Carissa, and I'm imagining Vera and Molly, this has been part of your journey as well as we really try to destigmatize real food. Like, I mean, good grief, there was no low fat yogurt a hundred years ago. You just, you know, you just made it from the cow milk and that's what you did. So I like you, was always advocating real food, you know, at least five or six, 8% dairy fat. And then I had my genetics and I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm going to give myself a heart attack. Like if I don't stop doing this. And so it just means that we have more information and it doesn't, it doesn't make the other foods bad. It makes them not right for you, for your optimal fuel mix. Molly. Okay. Any thoughts or Vera, go ahead. Well, I was just going to ask you, with Molly and I, we can have more saturated fat. And that's yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. You can have up to 28 grams a day, okay, which is, you think, oh, eight grams is a big deal. No, that eight grams is a big deal. And again, when I say that, it's like it's not like I want you every single day meticulously doing this. Know what that looks like roughly and stick pretty close to that, all right? So, yes, you two are able to have a little more. Molly and Vera still may decide not to do a ketogenic diet, although you can do it. I have clients who have my genes who do a ketogenic diet, but we do it with olive oil, we do it with avocados, avocado oil. We just really keep the saturated fat low. But, you know, that's just an option that you have if you guys move into that. All right, let's wrap it up with the carb ones, okay, because these ones particularly play such a big role in, again, the dopamine. I mean, we're talking Food Junkies podcast, the sugar, the refined grain addiction, and there's a couple that I want to cover here. One is the TCF7L2. This, again, like most of the carb genes, impacts our blood glucose balances, and these ones are really they have a lot of significant linkage with things like type 2 diabetes, more enhanced sensitivity to carbs, you know, the kind of when you start getting insulin sensitive or desensitized, and increased risk of things like metabolic syndrome. So this one, the first line I'm going to talk about is the one that is the largest risk for glucose, metabolic health, and colon inflammation. Of course, you mentioned inflammation, both the wrong fats, and the wrong types of carbohydrates impact our inflammation a lot. So even, let's see, with this one, we've got Vera and Clarissa that are heterozygous, one from each parent. Molly, you got the green thumbs up. You're homozygous with this one, but don't breathe easy because I know ahead what your other ones are. Okay. So Vera and Clarissa, you're going to want to eat low-starch vegetables and keep your simple carbs, things like any legumes you might need if you like if you eat hummus once in a while or start your vegetables, potatoes, sweet potatoes. We all know I'm already not talking ultra processed foods. Those are just off the table for really all of us who want any kind of a health. But for you, you're going to really need to keep that to one meal and possibly two. So if you do a little bit of berries, I know we and I had this conversation. She was like, oh, you can't take out all my little things. You know, you can probably do that with your protein. And if you feel good with a little bit of starch, a little bit of squash or something in that same day, great. If it feels too much, there's too much blood sugar fluctuations, cravings start coming in, drop it down to one a day. And Molly, you would be able to typically have that, you know, for sure at a couple of meals a day. So any responses to that, how you guys have done with your carbohydrate? No? Okay, I'll just carry on to the next one. The IRS1. Another gene that impacts insulin regulation, and this one has a lot to do with that visceral fat ratio, so how much abdominal fat you're carrying around your organs. And this one, lots of links to coronary artery disease. So Vera, you're homozygous for the variant, So and so is Molly. So I said you got off late on the first one, okay. Here, Clarissa is heterozygous, and again, you're looking at keeping those simple carbs to one meal. We talk a lot, and you guys, when I met with you each individually, we talked about an eight-week reset. So when we have a gene vulnerability, it doesn't mean that this is our life. You know, we are going to have to have this vulnerability expressed all the time. Typically, we do an eight-week reset, and we're, you know, Molly and Vera and Carissa are keeping their, you know, safer starches to just that one meal a day, and they're making sure that it's in half the size, so half the physical size of whatever protein they're having at that meal, you can reset these carb genes 
pull an expression, it's like you're almost like pulling a sheet over top of that genetic variation, so it doesn't get expressed. And Vera, you asked me in the first one, you said, yeah, yeah, but that because you, you're, you're a carb body type, you can handle that, you have different genes. Yes, to some degree, it is relevant as to the full spectrum of the genes, but almost everybody has the ability to reset their tolerance to some of the starches if they really get themselves a very, very low eight-week period with it, all right? Let's see here. I'm just going to wrap this up. Any question on CARB before I move into the one detox gene, Clarissa, that you wanted me to cover around raw and cooked veggies? That's exactly what I was just going to say because it's a CARB. So, yeah, yeah, go for it. Okay. So, basically, in the Nourish Your DNA review, we look at the fat response genes, carb response genes, protein response genes, look at stress response genes, and then we also look at detoxification genes. And these are super important because they are what processes either the naturally produced, the endogenous toxins that we produce when you go for a run or a workout or whatever, as well as the exogenous ones, the ones that come in from our hair care, you know, our skin care, the air that we breathe, that kind of thing. We basically have this in, in, a, in a simple terms in a phase one and phase two. So phase one breaks down these toxins and then makes them into a less damaging metabolite, less damaging byproducts. And then the phase two comes and cleans those up, helps, you know, bind with them and you rid them through your bowels and your skin and your lungs and your, you know, urinary tract. So what's really important is that we look at the phase one. There's one primary gene for that. Because if you've got a phase one that is just breaking down stuff like crazy, so, so good at breaking down toxins, and you have phase sluggish or vulnerable phase two ones, this is where we see people with a lot of inflammation, a lot of skin issues, a lot of even mental health issues, because we are not clearing material from our bodies that it's not supposed to be there anymore, okay? And again, this, you know, the toxins, this is not for strange fringe people anymore. The World Health Organization just said recently, damage and disease occur due to the inability of the body to clear incoming toxins and the resulting inflammatory processes that ensue. So with the three of you, Vera and Vera's homozygous for the variant, super, super challenged in this detoxification, okay? Not breaking them down quickly at all. Molly is heterozygous. You're kind of middle of the road, Molly, with it, okay? And then Clarissa is homozygous for the normal. And I'm so glad you guys give me these different gene examples so I can give the full spectrum. So Vera, for example, like I said, phase one detoxification is very vulnerable. Those toxins that are circulating are not getting done in a timely manner. So you're going to want to really, more than anybody, eat clean, you know, clean water, clean personal care products, you know, Household cleaning products. If your neighbors are spraying their lawn, don't go out and breathe it, okay? Clean, clean, clean. And you want to speed that process up a bit. And how you do that is by eating some raw cruciferous vegetables. Cruciferous vegetables, again, for our, our listeners that are going, I can't remember. That's broccoli, Brussels sprouts, kale, cabbage, arugula, cauliflower. So you're going to want to each day have small amounts of raw of vegetables like that. You're going to, if you like to barbecue, you can barbecue and have a little bit of char on it. Contrary to what I always teach my clients, no charred foods, it's cancer producing, okay? For Vera, a little char is going to be okay. And then you're also going to want to have some things like milk thistle, peppermint. Those are classic things that help speed up that phase one. You're going to want to stay away from caffeine. I know you already do. Another reason to stay away from it. And I hope you don't love turmeric and curcumin because they're not your friends. So those, I'm not saying never have a great Indian dish, just don't eat it on a regular basis. Now we look at Clarissa at the other end of the spectrum with this fast phase one. And I would consider Molly also fast because heterozygous, one of each is also considered fast with it. So you two are going to want to slow down that enzyme so it's not pumping out too many metabolites that are overwhelming the rest of your of your system. So that means you will slow it down with a little bit of caffeine if you can tolerate it, you know, a little bit of turmeric and curcumin. And you're going to want to avoid things like echinacea, milk thistle, you know, peppermint, charred meat, and you're going to want to eat your cruciferous vegetables cooked. 
So I don't care if they're roasted, steamed, barbecued, do whatever you want to them, but cook them so they're not speeding that up. Now, just a little caveat here, and then you guys can unmute and let me know what you think about this. Yes, we want to adjust the pasting of this because it, it keeps from getting, like I said, the inflammation, the cellular damage, the premature aging, the precancerous you know, conditions, all of that. But for everyone, this is, I've talked before about how you can reset the other, well, pretty well all the other systems in our body. The detoxification is not, it's kind of not set in stone, but it's not easy to, to reset. You know, our liver is like, as my, you know, my PhD botanist uh, partner says, it's like, it's like a sieve. And it gets blocked up with these toxins. So an eight-week reset with something like lysosomal glutathione or NAC can really clear that out. So it leaves you a little more, a little less vulnerable in the future. But for people that have vulnerable genes in this, and I'm waving myself with this as well in that phase two, I will just stay on one lysosomal glutathione, one NAC the rest of my life. Every time my frugal iris genes kick in and I go, okay, oh, yeah, this is ridiculous. I need to stop taking these. I go back to my ND and he goes, what are you doing? Your toxin levels are up. I'm like, oh, shoot. Okay. So they're just the reality of living in the current world that we live in. Vera wants to help speed up that first set. Molly and Clarissa, you want to slow that down a bit. Okay, what have you noticed any changes, Clarissa, since you shifted? Well, I think like when we talked, I had intuitively switched to right, right. the cooked veg because I was just feeling so much better. But then it made sense as to why. So I used to make these big raw vegetable salads, and it just again wasn't leaving me feeling very comfortable after. And so I just started, you know, roasting a lot of the vegetables, still having a big salad, but the vegetables that were in it were cooked. And right. it's, that's just now I just make sure all the vegetables I eat tend to be more cooked and, and it does, it does make me feel better. Oh, it's good. It just, it just helps your body get rid of the things that needs to get rid of on an ongoing basis. And it's often intangible things, a little more mental clarity, mm -hmm. you know, sharpness, like just feeling, yeah, just that you're like cleaner inside for lack of a scientific term, but you do feel like things are moving along better. Molly and Vera, any comments on the detox part? No, I'd say my experience is probably pretty similar to Clarissa, although I've always kind of done a mix of raw and cooked. I usually yeah, do raw. Yeah. yeah. I usually do raw, like at my lunchtime and I usually do a cooked vegetable in the evening time. So, so that part didn't change. I think it was just interesting. I think this was kind of like my big takeaway from you is like a lot of the things when we met, it was just kind of like validating because those were kind of natural organic changes that I had made along the way. I'd started out keto. And then like, after a while, I was like, Oh my gosh, I don't feel good doing this. And I started to feel sick to my stomach eating that way. And so like just naturally letting up on the fat, you know, the vegetable thing and, and really some of the other things that you've spoke about even today too, to just kind of say like, you know, if, when we're listening, when we're in tune, like our bodies really are telling us things. And then it makes sense that our genetics are saying like, Hey, like you might do better with this thing than the other. So yes, thank you so much. I appreciate it that having that mix definitely has helped me to feel feel better. So I appreciate Good. that input. Excellent. Yeah, it's always nice to get a kind of a stamp of genetic approval on something you've already found worked better. It's like, ah, oh, you knew. And I, I do want to emphasize that, Molly. I think that the key with the three of you is you got off the sugar and then you can listen to your body better. When we are on sugar and ultra processed foods, our ability to intuitively eat is out the window. So the first thing you guys did that was just brilliant for all of you is you allowed your body to pay attention to itself better, and that is huge. Vera. I just want to ask you, when you say uh, raw vegetables are cruciferous, I'm a real fan of rice cauliflower. It's like everywhere I can eat it, I will. But I do microwave it like for two minutes or one minute just to make it not so crisp. Is that still considered raw? Because it's not, it's not uh, it's, much... <laughs> No, it's, I mean, even that little bit is probably going to oh. deactivate some of the enzymes, okay? okay? But still still keep doing that, but maybe then just have maybe a little bit of a kale salad with it or oh, something yeah, I, I always have it. I, ha I always have <laughs> salad and I have sauerkraut and... I oh, yeah. Um, yeah, totally. That would anyway, that'll, that'll be great. That would be great. good because I, when you said I have to be, eat clean, I mean, I think you meant like literally clean, like like no herbicides and whatnot. And I am the worst for that. I don't wash my vegetables. My partner is saying, wash those vegetables, soak them up. And, okay. and, uh, 
Uh, listen to your partner. Listen to your partner, okay? But maybe I should just get the uh, supplements that you're talking about to keep my liver clean. You, you know what? It's a, it's a it's a workaround. You don't want to you know get clean. You want to wash them. Yes, do like the normal glutathione and NAC one a day. It'll just cover your bases, Vera. Right. In order to keep to that schedule that I like so much. I don't have time to wash my vegetables. <laughs> uh, yeah, I hear you. Uh, that type A routine person, yes, I, I've got that. So, yeah, so that gives you kind of the idea of, of what things to put in place. You know, where, how, Really, in conclusion, it's like we said, overlay these things, listen, what resonates with you, give it a try. If it's not producing positive benefits, something's off. You know, get back to the drawing board, talk to me again or whatever, but you will come up with a game plan that can literally – you change your lifestyle, you change your supplements, yes, Vera, you can change your life, and it's very encouraging. Yeah, that's awesome. Are you, can we share like a few of our other biggest takeaways? Are you oh, comfortable please. with that? Vera, please. did you have any other takeaways from meeting with Brenda that you didn't share today? That I didn't share today? No, probably not. I think I think the main takeaway is that that there is a, an explanation for the difference between what works for me and what works for you or Molly. Like it's, it, I think that's just really, really useful. I think the only takeaway is that I'm supposed to be eating a lot less protein than I want to be because I want to eat a lot. That's the one thing about keto that I like, but I want my protein and my rice cauliflower. So, <laughs> so I always say, Vera, give yeah. a two week trial, do one week, with as much protein as you want and your yeah. cauliflower, try the second week more closer to the recommended amount. Look right. at your energy, mental clarity, your moods, and right. your bloating, and just see which is works best for you. It's easy to do trial and error like that. Yeah, okay. All right, thank okay. you. Good. What about you, Molly? Any aha or shifts or changes you've had since you met with Brenda? I mean, I think again, you know, when we met, it was, I think already back in February, it was just very validating. I think too, though, it has definitely, now I haven't started to make these changes. I did add the vitamin E, I did vi add the vitamin D, I did the DIM Pro. There were some supplements that I did add, um, but the, the recommendation for me really was low carb, low fat, leaning toward Mediterranean. And I haven't quite made that shift yet. And I suspect some of it is just because it feels very overwhelming to me. And so that's definitely where I can empathize with clients who are trying to make these changes, right? It's just so much information. It's really, it really validates like how bio-individual this has to be. And that's why I love, you know, your phrasing of that optimal fuel mix for me. And so, you know, this is where I'm going to put my hand up and say, Brenda, I'm going to reach out to you. I'm going to like employ you. You are going to be my coach because I want to try this eight week you know, reset, feel, yeah. it, yes, this eight week reset with support with somebody who can like, I can bounce things off of and you can give me some feedback. So I would definitely, <laughs> definitely say I'm, oh. I'm going for it. Yeah. Well, and what's happening, Molly and Vera asked me this at the part one is that my understanding of needing to be more supportive of the people that are taking the nourisher DNA review, I'm actually piloting some program, 16 week program where we will do this because it is a lot of information and it's hard in our life to take everything in at once. So that I'm listening to you all and I am responding to that in ties. Okay. Maybe I'll need to get you three as guinea pigs again. You can be part of the pilot project. We'll see. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. And I have to say, um, you know, certainly I have been doing the eight week detox reset and it being very interesting that, you know, I'm just in the process. Uh, I spoke to you about going through like a very difficult breakup and usually this, you know, it would send me in a bit of a tangent and I've been eerily calm. And I think this probably has a lot to do with the cortisol reset, but could you speak to that a little bit? Yes. So when uh, we talked before about Clarissa being in a, a cycle and Molly to some degree as well, where the negative feedback uh, on the HPA axis, hypothalamus, pituitary adrenal axis is not working well. You're not being told to shut down cortisol production and epinephrine and norepinephrine in a timely manner. Then what is needed is a reset. And we use a product called Serenitin Plus, which is well, it's really interesting clinical research on it. It's just a milk molecule, teeny, teeny milk molecule, and it kind of skates under the radar so people who have allergies can, can take it. And it does a hard reset. Like, you know how you reboot your computer and just boom, okay? And then 
after you've done the eight weeks on that, depending upon how much stress, I have some clients that are on 12 week, okay, some are on six, but it's like they got their cortisol dopamine cycling back properly. And exactly like you just said, Carissa, something will happen that's challenging, a work thing or a relationship thing. And yes, there's going to be stress and you're going to feel some degree of grief and all of that, but it doesn't put you into a cortisol spiral, elevated spiral like that might have before. So I'm so, I'm not glad you have a breakup, but I am really glad that you are weathering it in the way that you are. And it will absolutely be a result of the Serenitin Plus. I've had clients on that who called me within a couple of weeks and said, like, is it possible this is working? I did not know people could wake up this morning in the morning and feel this calm and not have ruminating thoughts from the second they wake up and be focused on solving the problems of the world every minute of the day. So when you've lived in cortisol, you know, cortisol firing ongoing for years and years, it is so nice to have that reset happen. Yeah, absolutely. So, so much more peaceful. And I think my other aha takeaway was also that I was using athletic greens as my daily multivitamin supplement. And because I don't do raw vegetables well, you inform me, this is not the right multivitamin or greens to be on. And so I stopped taking it and now I'm taking just a multivitamin that you recommended. And again, I feel so much better. And I just kept trying to convince... I'm like, Andrew Huberman takes this, Max Lugavier, like, I, this is, it must be me. Like, I was convinced, like, had this would start working, but I just didn't feel well on it. So yeah. that was yeah. huge for me as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. And that is nothing, I, I, Athletic Greens are a great product. Like, hear me out, they're great. They're great for some people. And for people that really love a greens product but can't do that one, then Garden of Life is a better option. So it's really about just, figuring out the things that work for you. Like you said, Molly, optimal fuel mix, optimal supplement mix, supplement mix, and you're good to go. And I, I guess one thing I changed quite dramatically is I thought turmeric was good and I would put a lot of turmeric on, uh, on some, some of my dishes. And so you said, no, don't. <laughs> and you are right. Turmeric is great if you do well on turmeric. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And I think honestly, the whole point in this episode for us was to share with listeners that there's not just one way of eating. We are all so unique. And so, you know, if you're hearing only carnivore is going to get you there or only, you know, keto or paleo, like we need to learn to trust our bodies. And if we want to figure out what that optimal fuel mix, we can see someone like you and check in and like, then we can, we can get our own data right? Which is so important. I think it's really important to point out too, for everybody listening, right? Like we don't have a gene that's like, yes, you process these highly processed foods. Well, right. Like there's, there's not, not, there's no gene that's like, yes, eat all the sugar that you want. You're fine. This is, you know, sugar addiction isn't real. They're just trying to fear monger you into something. Everything, you know, every bit of this is saying, no matter if you're the variant or the homozygote, you know what I mean? Like no matter where you fall on that spectrum, you know, it's very much like eat foods that actually support the system within you, right? Like the functions within you, like you need to have nutrition, not just energy. And those are different things. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think that's where some of us get into hot water because I don't advocate an everything and moderation approach. Ultra processed foods, sugar, they are not good for us. They are not good for our children. They set dopamine issues happening. They set obesity and they set, you know, early metabolic syndrome. And, you know, now we no longer call, you know, adult onset diabetes. It's, it's type two diabetes. Those foods are the large part, the contributing factor to it. So I'm so glad you said that so vehemently, Molly, so I'm not always one waving the bandwagon and having everybody going, you can't say foods are bad. I go, those are not foods. Those, I do not call those foods. So. Absolutely. So can you tell us about the precision nutrition process? And like, if we have listeners that are like, I need to figure this out, where can they find you? Sure. So you can find me, you know, inbalancelm.com. It'll probably be in your show notes, Inbalance Lifestyle Management. And if you're just kind of dabbling and go, oh my goodness, I think I want to know a little bit about this, my digital book, you can buy it on there. It's like super inexpensive and it will at least get you started on real food for your body type. So even if you haven't had the time, you haven't gone to 23andMe or Ancestry or whatever, it will give you a little test that I use in my practice and you can start there. 
And then for those of you who do that or who already know you want more, if you have your genetics done through 23andMe or Ancestry, you just go to my website, the shop page, and you can literally book a review just like the three of you have done. And we will, I do a bunch of preliminary work and give you color coded sheets and little handbooks, and you'll get an, an hour online with me and really nail the most pertinent data and send you off with a, you know, a game plan. And then shortly, we will be having a longer program that incorporates that, that then says, you want some help in walking that out? Because it, it can be a lot, especially when we have busy lives and we're doing other things and we can't remember our head spinning when we left my session. I want to make sure it's not just data. I want you to actually be able to apply it practically. So yeah, that's the precision nutrition. Somebody, I think it was Vera that asked me if this is what that is. I said, well, I hadn't really thought about that, but it, you know, it probably is. And at least you're understanding that nurture trumps nature and you want to find out about your nature so you can find out how to trump it, you know? Yeah, I love that. And I think this is applicable for people who are just maybe starting out, but it's also for people who have been doing something for a while. Maybe they're feeling a little stuck and they just want to level up and like get their nutrition on point. Maybe they're struggling with volume or something like that. And, and we can just look in to see if there's just some little tweaks that we can make that might actually make a difference. So exactly. I just yeah. want to thank you so much, Brenda, You're for welcome. being here today. You have okay. definitely impacted my life. I've already <laughs> referred lots of clients to you. Yeah. And you. Uh, and yeah. I just appreciate the work that you're doing. Thank you so much. And back at all three of you, I, I yeah. just have to say I love your group. I love your Food Junkie support group because you actually get that everyone needs to be eating something different. And I just really appreciate that. So thank you. Right on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for joining us this week on Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life Support Group, I'm Sweet Enough. You can subscribe to our show in iTunes or Stitchers. That way you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies, which is available on Amazon. If you have any additional questions, both Molly and Clarissa are food addiction professionals and work one-on-one -on -one with clients. You can find their websites and email addresses in the show notes. Be sure to tune in every Friday when our new episodes drop. As Vera loves to say, the power is ours. <laughs>